Welcome back. All right, so the season ends uh, next Thursday. Next Thursday is the finish. And, of course, the debate is out there to be had about how any, you know, how, how could these teams win a cup? Who's going to be a cup favorite? I'm wearing Rangers because I think they're going to be one of the favorites when the playoffs roll around. I don't know if they're going to win it or not. I mean, they're, they're first place in the NHL, which Ranger fans will say, hey, President's Trophy didn't stop them in 94. But that was 30 years ago. It was before it became a President's Trophy curse. Uh, back in the 90s, it wasn't considered to be a big deal. You win the President's Trophy, you have a chance to win the Stanley Cup. But at any rate, the Rangers are leading the East and leading the NHL with 110 points. Uh, 78 games to get there. They have 42 regulation wins, which is tied with Winnipeg for the most in the NHL. So full respect to Winnipeg for those regulation wins. Keeping in mind, regulation wins are the tiebreaker. The first tiebreaker, anyways, if teams are tied in points at the end of the season. Uh, the Rangers, uh, Panarin, their leading scorer, 78 games, 46 goals, 69 assists, 115 points. They have five 20-goal scorers. So there's some depth there, too, with New York. Uh, from October 10th to December 31st, they scored 3.43 goals per game. They allowed 2.69 goals against. Uh, since January 1st, they've scored 3.47 goals per game, remarkably consistent, and allowed 2.84 goals against per game. So the goals against have come up a little bit, but so is the goals for. Honestly, really remarkably uh, consistent run by the New York Rangers and uh, a lot of fun to watch. Really a lot of fun to watch. Unless you're cheering for a team against the Rangers, then it's less fun. Uh, Boston, 78 games for them, 107 points. They said five points clear of Florida. Uh, so it's they're, they're pretty, pretty clearly going to win that division now. Uh, 35 regulation wins. Posternock, 78 games, 47 goals, 60 assists, 107 points. Now, with the Rangers, you can just look at them and say they're remarkably consistent. There's no reason they can't win a Stanley Cup. you got Shesterkin and Nett, Panarin up front, Fox on the blue line. A lot to like. With the Bruins, it's a little, little different. So they have the best goaltending tandem in the NHL. I think many will agree with that. Some will disagree. But it will be interesting to see if, in the playoffs, both Olmark and Swayman get starts. Since Swayman was better in the first half, I think olmark has been better in the second half. So three 20-goal scorers for the Boston Bruins, but Pavel Zaka sits with 19 goals. I did make, make note of players with 19 goals just because they only need one over the last few games. Uh, 3.20 goals scored per game, 2.60 uh, goals against per game for Boston from October 10th till December 31st. Since January 1st, 3.33 goals scored per game, 2.72 goals against per game. The one concern, and I've mentioned this before with Boston, center depth is really, really important come playoff time. I don't know if one through four, if Boston's centers are going to be able to keep up with some of the heavy hitters in the East, but we'll find out. So yeah, Boston's had a better season than I think most of, it is, most of us had expected. Then you get to Carolina, 78 games, 105 points for them. Sebastian Ajo, their leading scorer, 75 games. 33 goals, 52 assists, 87 points. Fantastic year for Ajo. And good chance he finishes with at least 90 points. He just needs three over the next four. Should get there. Uh, unless they rest him, which is possible. Players do get rested as we get down the stretch. Uh, four 20-goal scorers for Carolina. A team with 41 regulation wins, which again is right near the top number in the NHL. 3.32 uh, goals scored per game from October 10th to December 31st. 3.11 goals against per game. Remember, we were all talking about goaltending and their goaltending is not going to be good enough. they got to fix their goaltending. Well, since January 1st, they're scoring 3.37 goals per game. So right about the same, they're allowing 2.07 goals against per game. So Kachetkov's had a remarkable turnaround. And Freddie Anderson's looked fantastic since returning from injury. So the concern with Carolina would have been goaltending. Now, I, I don't know if there are very many concerns. The one question becomes, if this team gets to a conference final, if they get through, say, the Rangers in the second round, will they be able to win games in a conference final? Will the goal scoring hold out through a long run in the playoffs? That's been the issue for Carolina. And then Florida, 78 games, 102 points for them. 39 regulation wins, so they have more regulation wins than Boston. Uh, not as many as Carolina and the Rangers. Uh, Sam Reinhart, career year, and of course his contract's up this year. 78 games, 53 goals, 37 assists, 90 points. They have four 20-goal scorers, and Sam Bennett sitting with 19 currently. So some good scoring depth there with Florida. Uh, 2.97 goals per game from October 10th to December 31st. 2.56 goals against per game since January 1st. They've been fantastic. 
3.43 goals scored per game, so right up near the Rangers, allowing 2.43 goals against per game. Less than the Rangers or the Bruins. More than Carolina, but again, Carolina's 2.07 is the best one on the board. So, and, and it's not even necessarily all that close, so just throwing that out there. But for Florida, of course, we know what they can do. We know what they did last season. And so would a Stanley Cup in Florida surprise people? Maybe some, but not nearly as many as would have been surprised, say, three years ago uh, before the Florida Panthers won a President's Trophy and then went all the way to the final of the year after that. Uh, Toronto, 76 games, 97 points. They have 32 regulation wins, which is less than other teams around them, but still more than the teams at the bottom here. Uh, Matthews, 75 games, 64 goals, 36 assists, and even 100 points. Matthews has had a remarkable year. 420 goal scorers for Toronto, but Tyler Bertuzzi is sitting with 19 currently, so it could be five soon. Uh, 3.53 goals scored per game, 3.44 goals allowed per game from October 10th to December 31st. Since January 1st, they've been better. Since January 1st, Toronto scoring 3.69 goals per game allowing 2.81 goals against. And it's interesting because how many times have we talked about, you know, goalie issues with the Toronto Maple Leafs and defensive issues with the Leafs, but their 2.81 goals against per game is less than the Rangers. So, again, since January 1st. So Toronto's defense takes a lot of flack, and I know people are going to dump on Toronto because of their, their track record in the playoffs. But, again, every year to me is, is somewhat of a clean slate. Maybe this is the year for Toronto. Maybe this is the year they get it done. And again, people will laugh, but there's no reason to think they can't. Uh, we'll just see how things turn out once the playoffs get rolling. Uh, Tampa Bay, 77 games, 93 points for them. Uh, 35 regulation wins. Nikita Kucherov, 76 games, 43 goals, 93 assists, 136 points. And of course, uh, if he gets seven assists in his next five games, that's 100 assists for him. We could have two 100 assist players. I don't know if that's ever happened in the NHL before. I'm thinking back to the Lemieux-Gretzky era, maybe. But it, it is remarkable. Uh, 520 goal scorers for Tampa Bay. Sorelli with 19. He's missed the last couple with injuries. So we'll see if he ends up getting to that 20-goal mark. Uh, tw 3.26 goals scored per game. 3.45 goals allowed per game from October 10th to December 31st. And keeping in mind that Vasilevsky was injured to start the season. They went with Johansson. And they were losing some games there and, and, and sometimes losing by a lot. But since January 1st, they've scored 3.77 goals per game and allowed 3.08 goals against per game. So the goals against is still a little bit high. It's higher than anybody else above them in the standings. Uh, it's actually lower than anybody beneath them in the standings. So I guess they're right where they should be. Uh, but Tampa Bay, we know in the playoffs what they can do. So is anybody going to be surprised if they win a Stanley Cup? Maybe. But uh, Tampa Bay is definitely capable. Uh, the New York Islanders, 77 games, 85 points for them. So they're currently two points clear of the playoff line. Everybody above them is clinched. So this is where two out of five are going to make it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Barzell, the leading scorer for, for the uh, New York Islanders, 76 games, 23 goals, 53 assists, 79 points. 420 goal scorers for the Islanders. Anders Lee with 19 goals could very well end up hitting 20. Uh, they do have 26 regulation wins, which is the lowest number on the board. That's your tiebreaker, too. So the Islanders have to finish ahead of everybody else. They do not have as many regulation wins. They scored 3.03 goals per game and allowed 3.22 goals against per game from October 10th to December 31st. Since the 1st of January, they've been scoring less, 2.88 goals per game. They've allowed about the same, 3.2 goals against per game. And yet, here they are. They could very well end up, end up making the playoffs. We know with the Islanders that they can be a tough out. Do they have enough to win a Stanley Cup? It is Patrick Waugh as the coach. And honestly, if Patrick Waugh in his first year as a coach with the Islanders were to win a Stanley Cup, that, that'd be that'd be an interesting plot line, wouldn't it? Now we get to Detroit. Uh, 77 games, 84 points for them. They have 27 regulation wins. Raymond's their leading scorer. 76 games, 26 goals, 37 assists, 63 points. They have 320 goal scorers. Patrick Kane sits with 19, which is remarkable considering he has not played the full season, of course. So Kane, a big driving force to keep this team above the playoff line. Uh, before December 31st, they scored 3.54 goals per game and allowed 3.46. Interestingly, interestingly, with Detroit, 
Uh, they've scored 3.1 since January 1st. They've allowed 3.13 goals against per game since January 1st. So uh, the goal differentials slightly turned against them. They're scoring less, but they're also allowing less. So, yeah, Detroit, it's it's anybody's guess what we would get if they get into the playoffs. I don't think a cup win is, is on the table for Detroit at this point. I, I can't even find a way to make an argument for a cup win. Making the playoffs, it feels like it's a bit of a bit of a victory, though, and would definitely alert some players that hey, they got something going on in Detroit, and uh, might make it a little bit a uh, little bit easier for Eiserman to sign guys in the off season, uh, both bringing guys back and maybe you know enticing players to come play in Detroit, have a chance to build this team back up to the status of an actual true contender. Uh, but they're not they're not that far off, I don't think, from getting there just organically next season. We'll see. Uh, then below the line, you got Pittsburgh. 77 games, 83 points. They have 31 regulation wins. So they have that tiebreaker on Detroit as well as on the Islanders. Crosby, their leading scorer, 77 games, 40 goals, 45 assists, 85 points. They have four 20 goal scorers. So everybody's in basically the same range here, three to five. Uh, some of them have four, going to have five. In the case of Tampa Bay, they could end up with six. Uh, for Pittsburgh... 3.00 goals scored per game. They've allowed 2.63. That's from October 10th to December 31st. Since January 1st, scoring 3.05 goals per game and allowing 3.21. So the goaltending has been a bit of an issue since the new year. But recently, over their last 10, they're playing very well. Uh, they've got four wins in a row coming into tonight's game against Toronto. We'll see if they end up back above the playoff line and maybe bump the Islanders down and bump Detroit back out of the playoffs. And then you got Washington. They've lost six in a row. Not all in regulation, so they're still getting points here and there. Dylan Strom's been their leading scorer. 77 games, 26 goals, 38 assists, 64 points for him. They only have three 20 goal scorers, but goal scoring really hasn't been a, a major feature for the Capitals. They have 28 regulation wins amongst their, their 83 points in 77 games. These three teams all have the same record, 36, 30, and 11. For the Capitals... 2.29 goals scored per game from October 10th to December 31st. 2.79 goals against. Since January 1st, 2.93 goals scored per game. 3.47 goals against per game. So just, to me, the fact that the goal scoring has gone up, and so has the goals against, and it's almost equal. Where they almost go up by a .7 here, and they almost go up by a .7 here. It means their games are getting a little more eventful. But it's it's not turning in their favor. So their games are a little more fun to watch when they're scoring like that. But the goals against have gone up as well. Um, I don't know how much of that's Darcy Kemper, though. Kemper has had a rough time of it uh, over the second half of the season. Lindgren, it's definitely his net, especially if they do end up making the playoffs. Then you got Philadelphia, who have really taken themselves out of this. 77 games, 83 points for them. They have 28 regulation wins at all uh, as well. Uh, Konechny. 72 games, 31 goals, 34 assists, 65 points is their leading scorer. They have four 20 goal scorers, uh, scoring 2.94 goals per game and allowing 2.72 goals against per game from October 10th to December 31st. Hardworking team, tough to play against, really tough to play that style of hockey the full season. Since January 1st, they've scored 2.76 goals per game, so that's a drop. Uh, their goals against has gone up by 0.8 to 3.52. So they're allowing almost a goal more per game than what they're producing. So while today at a press conference, John Tortorella downplaying that and saying the defense has been fine, uh, the reality is the numbers show you that the defense, the goaltending, it's really not worked for them since January 1st. But again, uh, Philadelphia wasn't expected to be in this position at all. So finishing with a record of above 500, I think, is a win for Philadelphia as an organization. Uh, but we'll see how the final five games play out. Maybe they rally. I'm, I'm not I'm not betting on it, though. They lost to Chicago and Columbus. That tells you the rally is highly unlikely. Then we get over to the West. So we start with Dallas. 78 games, 107 points for them. 38 regulation wins. Robertson's their leading scorer. 78 games, 27 goals, 50 assists, 77 points. I'd probably want more goals out of Robertson. But honestly, he's around point per game. Can't complain there. Uh, eight 20 goal scorers. Eight. Nobody's close to that. Eight. Uh, Dallas's depth is absolutely, it's just, it's ridiculous. Uh, they scored 3.6 goals per game before January the 1st. 3.03 uh, .03 goals against per game. Their numbers have improved since January 1st. 3.74 goals scored per game, allowing 2.77 goals against per game. So absolutely insane run that we've seen Dallas go on. 
Uh, it's been a lot of fun for me to watch as a Dallas fan. We'll see how it works out come playoff time. Then there's Vancouver, 77 games, 102 points. They have 41 regulation wins. Uh, JT Miller's been their leading scorer. Nobody's complaining about his contract right now. 77 games, 35 goals, 62 assists, 97 points. So there's a realistic possibility JT Miller hits that 100-point mark as well. Uh, four 20-goal scorers for Vancouver, so right in that sweet spot where most other teams are with about four. Again, Dallas is just this freak show with eight of them. Uh, Vancouver, you can see the numbers have dramatically dropped off. Before January 1st, they were scoring 3.78 goals per game. They're, they're allowing 2.56. Uh, for Vancouver, 3.1 goals per game before Jan or since January 1st and 2.83 goals against. So for Dallas, you can make the argument of there's all that depth scoring. Ottinger's already shown he can be hot in the playoffs. They're a team that absolutely is very dangerous for a Stanley Cup. Vancouver, they need Demko back. They need him to be 100% as well. Uh, they also need for Pedersen to up his game. Like, I haven't complained about Pedersen because it's it's a, he's a young player. It's a long contract. I don't see any point in complaining about the player. But I will say, yes, he does need to step up his offensive production come playoff time especially. And Quinn Hughes needs to show that come playoff time, when the games are a lot more difficult, uh, that he can continue to produce for them as well. So there are some uncertainties with Vancouver, but if all of those fall into place, why can't Vancouver go on a run? All right, Colorado, 78 games, 102 points for them. They have 40 regulation wins. They are second in the division. After last night's loss to Dallas, any hopes of them catching Dallas, probably done. Uh, McKinnon, 78 games, 48 goals, 65 assists, 133 points. Just an amazing season for Nathan McKinnon. Absolutely remarkable. Uh, three 20 goal scorers for Colorado, but there are two players who have 19. So they could very well end up with five players with 20 goals by season's end. Uh, 3.59 goals scored per game. They're allowing 2.97 against. That's from October 10th to December 31st. Since January 1st, their numbers have got better offensively, 3.8 goals per game. They're allowing 3.12 goals against per game. That's problematic. Um, Georgiev has had issues with stopping the puck. This is why the question would get asked of Coach Bednar about who the starting goaltender might be come playoff time because it's obvious that Georgiev, whether he's been overworked or maybe teams have a book on him, Georgiev's numbers haven't been spectacular, and that can be a problem during the playoffs, right? Um, offense can win out in the playoffs, but very often that team with really strong defense ends up winning that series. Winnipeg, 77 games, 100 points, 42 regulation wins. And even though it's been more of a struggle lately, I think if I told Jets fans in October, hey, they're going to end up with 100 plus points, I think Jets fans would have taken it. Uh, Mark Shifley has been their leading scorer, 70 games, 23 goals, 43 assists, 66 points, right around a point per game. Very reliable that way. They have three 20 goal scorers. Uh, Velarde has 19. So Velarde, of course, has missed some time. Uh, 19 goals for him. He should get to 20, I would think, over these next five games. Uh, they scored 3.34 goals per game and allowed 2.5, 2.49 goals against per game from October 10th to December 31st. Since January 1st, the scoring has dropped off a lot. 2.86 goals per game. The goals against have dropped a little bit, 2.45, but the fact that they're struggling to score... That has to turn around if this team's going to make a run in the playoffs. Like, when you look at the West, uh, I with Colorado, obviously, they won the Cup in 2022. They just have to find a way to recreate that, and they have to get their goals against down. For Winnipeg, they have to figure out a way to get their goals for up. So if this ends up being a first-round series between Colorado and Winnipeg, that's going to be part of the storyline right there. Spoiler alert, because I'm going to get into big-time storyline stuff once we get to the previews for the playoff series. Um, and for fans of, or for, for subscribers of the channel who haven't been here during playoff time, it's a hoot. All right, uh, the Oilers, 76 games, 99 points. So they still have their eyes set on catching Vancouver for first in the division. They have that game in hand. They play them head-to-head -head once, and they're only three points back. They have 37 regulation wins. Connor McDavid, a fantastic year for him. 74 games, 31 goals, 99 assists, 130 points. So he, he could hit 100, 100 assists in his next game. Uh, 420 goal scorers for the Oilers. Before December 31st, they were scoring 3.4 or 3.56 goals per game, allowing 3.24 goals against per game. Since January 1st, 3.6 goals per game and allowing 2.55. So Edmonton's been fantastic when they've needed to be. 
in order to get themselves back into this position after a really, really slow start to the year. And now they're back where we had expected them to be before the season started. Uh, so we'll see how the Oilers, how this all turns out for them. But yeah, McDavid, kind of a sensational season. Nashville, 78 games, 94 points for them. Uh, 36 regulation wins. They're six points back of the Jets. They've only got four games left. Their chances of catching the Jets are basically nil at this point. Uh, Forsberg's been their leading scorer. 78 games, 43 goals, 46 assists, 89 points. After an injury-riddled season last year, that's how you have a comeback. Four 20-goal scorers for Nashville as well. Scoring 3.08 goals per game before the new year, allowing 3.14 goals against during that time. So some struggles there. It looked like they wouldn't make the playoffs for a while. Uh, since the 1st of January, 3.32 goals per game and allowing 2.90 goals against per game. And basically ending St. Louis's hopes of making the playoffs. St. Louis sits with 87 points. They have more points than all of these teams right here, but out West, it's not enough to make the playoffs. So Nashville has had a really, really strong run. And so we'll see if they're still dangerous come playoff time. They've had a bit more of a struggle over the last couple of weeks. I'll be fascinated to see how that turns out. But Nashville plays well as underdogs, right? So the argument you can make for for the Jets is if, they're, if their offense turns around, they make a run to the cup. For the Oilers, it really is, does the depth show up when they need it come playoff time? A similar argument can be made for Toronto. Look at the times Toronto gets knocked out and how often the depth scoring isn't there. Uh, for, for Nashville, though, it really is, they play well as underdogs. Can Soros take them to a cup? When they got to the final in 2017, a huge part of the reason why was Pekka Rene. Can Soros have that kind of a run? Uh, the LA Kings are third in the division, but they're behind Nashville in points. 77 games, 93 points for them. Uh, 35 regulation wins. Uh, Kempe, 77 games, 27 goals, 44 assists, 71 points. Uh, four 20 goal scorers, but Quinton Byfield sits with 19, so it could very well be five when the playoffs roll around. Uh, they scored, they scored 3.48 goals per game and allowed 2.33 uh, per game from October 10th to December 31st. Uh, it's been more of a struggle since the 1st of January. Scoring 2.84 goals per game and allowing 2.75 goals against per game. So while they're going to make the playoffs, what are they going to do in those playoffs? That's a valid question to ask. Then you got the Vegas Golden Knights. 76 games, 92 points. So tonight against Vancouver, they play that game in hand they have on the Kings and can leapfrog the Kings and put themselves in a position where they could play the Oilers in the first round or maybe Vancouver. Uh, so 32 regulation wins for the Vegas Golden Knights. Marcia So, their leading scorer. 76 games, 41 goals, 25 assists, 66 points. Uh, 320 goal scorers for Vegas, but Hurdle's going to be back in the lineup. And uh, There's other players who would have got to 20 if not for injury. Uh, scoring 3.32 goals per game and allowing 2.76 goals per game from October 10th to December 31st. And scoring 3.1 goals per game and allowing 3.13 goals against per game since January 1st, meaning... Vegas and Detroit have the same same goals for and goals against per game since January 1st. So perception can be quite different between two different teams. Uh, Vegas, of course, defending Stanley Cup champions. It automatically makes them a difficult out in the first round. Uh, and I, I, I don't know that they necessarily would go out in said first round. And then to close this out, I wanted to talk a little bit because I know people talk about, you know, playoff seeding and everything. So if we did one versus eight, two versus seven, and so on and so on. You end up with the Rangers against Detroit in the first round, Boston against the Islanders. Uh, you get Carolina against Tampa Bay, and then Florida against Toronto in the first round. So Carolina jumps past the Islanders. The Islanders currently third in their division. So instead of getting uh, the, the New York Islanders, as Carolina would currently get, instead they would get Tampa Bay. Carolina wouldn't like that. Uh, then, when you look out west, Dallas would be playing against Vegas. That would be fun. Uh, Vancouver would play against L.A. Well, that, that, would, that would not necessarily be a great matchup for Vancouver. Uh, 2012. 2012's calling. Uh, Colorado-Nashville, and then Winnipeg and Edmonton. Winnipeg and Edmonton would be a really fun series uh, in the first round. So we have four Canadian teams out of 16. Uh, if you watch American commercials, uh, talking about the the playoffs they don't really talk much about the canadian teams it's weird because in canada we talk about the american teams so but at any rate 
uh, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Which which team can you make the strongest argument for as the potential 2024 Stanley Cup champion? Let me know your thoughts. Hit like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. I've Because I wanted to do this video for a while. I wanted to make sure that I, I put in the time and, and went through and tried to make the argument for every team. And if you're saying, well, you didn't really really try to make the argument for, for the Flyers... I don't know that I can. Obviously, with the Caps, you have Ovechkin. You have if Lindgren can get it going. And just from a nostalgia perspective, both Pittsburgh and Washington could approach this like the Devils. That year, they went to the Stanley Cup final that no one expected. And that was basically like that last hurrah for Marty Berdur. I could see Pittsburgh or Washington trying to do that for Crosby or Ovechkin. But for the Flyers, I, I can't I can't make that argument. But let me know your thoughts. Hit like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Thank you guys so much for your time and your attention. I will talk to you again soon.